positions in nonprofit management. And for the last five years, she has been active in climate change education. She is co-founder of Sea Change Conversations, a New Jersey nonprofit that promotes nonpartisan discussion about climate change across the country. She is national vice chair for sustainable architecture and food for the Garden Club of America's Conservation Committee. And she serves on the Energy and Environment Commission of the town of Sharon. She's a former trustee of the Stony Brook Millstone Watershed Institute in New Jersey. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Gretchen. Can everyone hear me? Just nodding would be okay. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to thank the Hotchkiss Library of Sharon for celebrating Earth Day um, with this exploration of what I think of as our most elemental connection with the earth, and that is our source of food. Um, so I wanna just jump right in and start off our exploration of food and climate change and the path forward by looking backward for a bit. So we're gonna take a brief look at a history of farming and it's kind of Katie's history of farming. We're gonna begin with farmers who were working the land hundreds of millions of years ago. Farmers who made this planet what it is today. Farmers who created a vital economy, a secondary barter economy, and a sophisticated disposal system. And I am speaking, of course, about plants. Early plant life harvested energy from the sun and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and combined them to create food. Like many modern farming operations, this process created waste and the waste was called oxygen. So animals emerged on the scene and they did three things. They used the plant's waste product of oxygen in order to breathe. They ate the plants and then they breathed out more carbon dioxide, which helped the remaining plants thrive. And without this natural trading system of exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide, we wouldn't be here. And I, I ask you to look down at the bottom of this slide that says that soil stores excess carbon. That's really um, a secondary barter economy. That's how I think of it. And it's really almost as important as, as the carbon cycle. And it looks like this. Um, in this underground economy, plants send some of the carbon down through their root tips into the soil to trade to microbes in exchange for nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And there's this incredible network of mycorrhizal fungi that's facilitating this exchange. In addition, plants have this elegant disposal system. When the plants and the animals that eat them die, the stems and the leaves and the bones decompose and sink deep, deep down within the soil, taking excess carbon with them. So over millions of years, this excess carbon has become pools of oil and natural gas or bits of coal, safely stored and sequestered out of the system deep within the soil. So when you think about it this way, you realize that everything that we humans make, use, fly, drive, wear, and eat is dependent on these plant-based systems. Okay, so that was chapter one in Katie's history of farming. And we're gonna fast forward now through millions of years to the next chapter uh, with some very different types of farmers. So we have a timeline here that shows 20,000 years ago to the present, and the vertical axis shows temperature change above and below a global average of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see by following the orange line that over the course of 12,000 years, the average global temperature increased by seven degrees, taking us out of an ice age and arriving at this steady average temperature of 60 degrees. And that 
is when humans started mimicking plants and got into the agricultural act. Trade routes were created, economies grew, civilizations appeared. Okay, and speaking of civilizations, we're gonna fast forward again to our own civilization. I suggest to you that the roots of the American economy are in our fertile soil. In the 19th century, productive North American land and hardworking farmers created enough food to feed our country with enough left over to trade to the nations of the world. We built infrastructure to get crops and livestock to ports and cities, canals, barges, steamboats, railroads, and of course, eventually airports were needed to move the food from the farm to the table. And that infrastructure helped build our coal, our steel, our fossil fuel, and other industries. Then in the 20th century, global populations trebled and we exuberantly took on the challenge of feeding the world. So we subsidized industrialized agricultural methods. We added chemical fertilizers and bigger machines. We consolidated small family farms into massive corporate farms for market efficiency. And we simplified our crop choices to just a few, predominantly corn, soy, wheat, and cotton. We now know that all of these choices had an impact on our climate. <clears throat> By conservative estimates, modern farming methods are responsible for almost a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. There's recent research that says it's actually as much as 34%, but I'm gonna stick with that more conservative number. And even that is, is quite something that a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. And um, I just wanna make a quick detour here to identify some of those emissions. I think we all hear about carbon dioxide all the time, but agricultural emissions also include methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and while these, these um, greenhouse gases don't last in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide, they have much greater warming capacity while they're here. Methane warms um, the atmosphere 25 times the power of carbon dioxide and, and nitrous oxide has 300 times the warming power. So I just wanted to kind of explain why they are such um, important contributors. Okay. Um, so let's jump in and see where these emissions come from. And I'm, I'm going to start with the, the cow in the field because I think um, we hear a lot about this. <laughs> these animals give us energy through their meat and through dairy. Per capita, Americans eat roughly 57 pounds of beef every year. That adds up to a total of 18 billion pounds of beef and 630 pounds of dairy uh, per capita or, or a total of 206 billion pounds of dairy. It's a lot of cheese. Current cattle rearing methods contribute greenhouse gases in five ways and I wanna go through them quickly. I think we've all heard that cows emit methane when they burp. These methane rich belches account for 35% of agricultural greenhouse gases. So that's 35% of the quarter of um, emissions contributed by agriculture. <clears throat> Animals also leave waste. So according to the Centers for Disease Control, the manure lagoons in concentrated animal feeding operations emit significant amounts of methane and nitrous oxide, those two potent greenhouse gases I mentioned. And number three, there's deforestation. Livestock production is the world's largest user of land. In 2018, we lost 30 million acres of tropical forests to agriculture, most of it to support cattle. And satellite-based research has found that between 2019 and 2020, loss of vital forests in the tropics increased by 12 
12% despite the pandemic. Forests are being cleared to make way both for grazing and for the planting of massive fields of soy and corn grown to feed the cows. And speaking of the corn that the cows eat, corn is the second biggest crop grown in America. And to grow it, we use a lot of synthetic fertilizer, which brings us to issue number four, fertilizer. So I never realized this, but um, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is made from natural gas. Now it kept millions of people from starving in the last half century by boosting plant productivity. But because it's made from natural gas, it um, A, is made from fossil fuel, but B, to turn that natural gas into fertilizer, you have to heat it to an incredibly high temperature, which requires huge inputs of heat and energy. And the process emits both carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. And then once you put the nitrogen fertilizer onto the land, the plants take some up and grow, but any excess is eaten by soil microbes and they convert it into nitrous oxide. The rest gets washed into our water supply and wreaks havoc there by creating algal blooms, which also emit methane. And the fifth cattle related issue is the loss of wetlands. Apparently half of this, excuse me, approximately half of this country's wetlands have been drained, much of it to be turned into cropland and pasture for livestock. In fact, worldwide, humans have been farming in river floodplains for millennia, taking advantage of those carbon rich, fertile wetland soils. Think about the fertile crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates where agriculture began, some say. So the thing about wetlands is that they're exceptionally good at absorbing or sequestering carbon. So when we drain wetlands, we are losing that carbon absorption tool. And also the peat that lies at the bottom is exposed when you drain wetlands and it dries out. And when peat dries out, it oxidizes and emits carbon dioxide. And of course, we are also losing those rich wetland ecosystems that support us and so many other species. So altogether, these five issues, the methane belches, the manure lagoon emissions, the deforestation, the fertilizer used on the crops and the draining of wetlands combine to give cattle this significant carbon footprint. And you can see from this graph here um, that other animals are contributing greenhouse gases as well. But beef and dairy just have this outsized effect in terms of carbon emissions per serving compared to, to other animal proteins. So I thought, okay, I get that, but what about, what about the planting of plants? Does that cause emissions? What if we all just ate rice? Well, the cultivation of rice is also a contributor. Rice is responsible for at least 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions because the wet fields where rice is grown are breeding grounds for microbes that emit methane. When you think about rice, it's the staple crop for approximately half of the world's population. So we grow a lot of rice on this little planet. Another plant related source of emissions is Elasis skinesis, also known as the African palm tree, which is the source of palm tree oil used in everything these days. Pasta sauces, hand lotion, lipstick, nut butters, dried fruit, detergent, mm. chocolate bars, and sadly, even ice cream. And in Indonesia and Malaysia, we humans are cutting down acres and acres of complex, ancient, carbon-rich tropical forests and draining wetlands to make way for plantations of this one fast-growing plant 
the African palm oil tree. We emit carbon not only from the forest, but also from the newly bared soil. So speaking of soil, I want to talk for a little bit about how our agricultural methods are affecting our ability to store carbon in the soil. What is soil? It's crushed mineral rich stones, water, air and organic matter. And it is that organic matter that is the fertility of our soil that organic matter that is made up of carbon rich bits of decomposing plant and animal. Healthy soil is this fabulous interconnected world rich in mycorrhizal fungi and microbial activity teeming with these chemical and biological messages. Um, it's got this incredible communications network that's kind of like our internet and it's with all sent on, you know, these messages sent on these invisible filaments called hyphae. And yet, we rip it apart every time we plow the soil, thus releasing carbon into the air. So when we humans started planting fields, we started to plow or till the soil with, you know, one human or maybe a couple of oxen pushing a plow through the earth. Now we are using these immense fossil fuel powered tractors that can till or plow hundreds of acres in a matter of hours. And we have good reason to plow. You know, it breaks up the soil and makes it crumbly and aerated. It prevents the spread of weeds and it makes it easier to insert seeds. Most of our modern farming equipment has been designed to seed in, you know, insert seeds into these straight furrows that are, are created by plowing. But the downside is that this tears up the soil and rips apart that carbon storage system at our feet, exposing that organic matter to the sun and oxygen, which destroy it. And that releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So just to, to give you a sense of what this is doing on a sort of national scale, the, car, the organic carbon content of Iowa soils has gone from 5%, which is considered very healthy to have 5% carbon content, to 3% in the last 100 years. Critically, tilling and loss of organic matter are also making soil vulnerable to erosion. Globally, we are losing about 1% of vital topsoil every year, 10 times that rate in the United States and 20 to 30 times that rate in Asia. And we'll see why that's so important in a minute. But first, I wanna to touch on one more way that our food system is contributing greenhouse gas emissions. And that is the food we throw away. 30 to 40% of our food is sent to landfill. So when we send trash to the dump or to landfill, it breaks down anaerobically, that is to say without um, oxygen. And that process emits methane. Secondly, when you think of all the energy inputs that went into making the food from the diesel for the tractor, the fertilizer on the fields, the electricity in the irrigation pump, the refrigerated semis that are transporting the food from the farm to the supermarket, we're just taking a third of that energy and throwing it away. Okay, so We've examined how cultural agricultural systems make up a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. I wanna kind of pivot now and look at how climate change is impacting our farming and our food production. And to start off, I wanna share a couple of maps with you. Um, this is a map that woke me up to the severity of climate change. It's from the nonpartisan World Resources Institute, and it shows projected change in crop yields if the global average temperature rises by 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, a rise of 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit is 
at the lower end of the range of current predictions in uh, rises in global ten uh, temperatures by the century's end, according to the UN Meteorological Organization. So if we look at this map, red indicates where crop yields will decline and green indicates where yields will go up. The models used for this projection also indicate that if temperatures rise by more than 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit, there's no green left on the map. Okay, but those are models and who knows what will happen to those models. What about what's been going on recently? This is a 2017 map from our own NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And it shows us that today, now, we are living in a world of extremes. So extreme drought is shown on this map in all the brown areas and extreme moisture in all the blue. Scientists say that climate change will increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. Now, I wanna be clear here, climate change does not cause extreme weather, but it amplifies the severity. So let's take a look at what the extreme weather is doing currently to our farmland. On the one hand, there are droughts caused by increased evaporation brought on by prolonged high temperatures. We also have less snowpack in our mountain ranges, which leads inevitably to less snow melt and less water in our once fertile valleys. Droughts are making land more susceptible to wildfires and we are seeing that play out tragically in California and Australia and other places across the world. But even more critically is the effect of drought on soil. I wish I could say that this was a colorized photo from the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, but this photograph was taken in the summer of 2018. Globally, there are about 1 billion acres of degraded agricultural land, land that has been over irrigated, over tilled, over grazed, land that is no longer arable that is no longer absorbing carbon. We have taken carbon rich, fertile soil and turned it into dirt, susceptible to dust storms and erosions. And this is happening at a time when our population is increasing from 7.5 billion to 11 billion by century's end. The other end of the spectrum, there's flooding. Climate change exacerbates extreme rain events because warmer air holds more water vapor and when it is released, more water comes down. And we've been seeing these increases in heavy rains across our country and in other countries as well. So again, weakened topsoil is vulnerable to erosion during these extreme storms, but soil's not the only thing that we are losing, crops and livestock are being lost in these storms. And then there's um, the new derecho. Uh, last summer, a derecho, which is a, like an inland hurricane. It's a hurricane that is, doesn't start over the ocean. Um, this derecho flattened 10 million acres of Iowa corn. That was 43% of the corn that was planted in Iowa last year. One storm. Even without floods and storms, warm, wet conditions are perfect breeding grounds for blight, fungus, and insect proliferation. So currently, they estimate that for each increase in land temperature of 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, bugs and blight will destroy an additional 10 to 25 percent of our crops. Um, the seeds of many crops need to be cold and dormant for a certain period every year. If you're a farmer, you know this. Uh, for example, peach, apple, and cherry trees all need about four to five weeks of dormancy at temperatures consistently below 45 degrees in order to flower and fruit. And some of our agricultural regions are just not seeing those consistent weeks of low temperatures anymore. As you can see, the average low is getting higher, and then there's weather weirding with 
these warm winters and then blizzards in the spring. And those are also um, affecting crop yields. And on top of that, plants are flowering out of sync with their natural pollinators so that once they do flower, the odds of being pollinated are reduced. Now, some people say that increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going to help plants grow bigger and faster. I mean, after all, isn't that what plants love? But there's new research that suggests that these toddler sized plants will be much less nutritious for us because the plants are making more sugars as more carbon is available to them. And that's squeezing out the other nutrients that were historically available to those who ate plants. And let's not forget that weeds and invasive plants will be growing bigger and faster as well. But not all plants will grow bigger. Most plants like humans are stressed by extreme heat. A 2019 article in The Economist reported that the long hot summer of 2018 adversely affected the potato crop all across England and Europe where potatoes were much smaller than usual. And it's not just size that's decreasing, yields are also going down as temperatures go up. And what about the three pillars of happiness? Coffee, chocolate, and wine. Well, coffee and chocolate are grown in the tropic zone within 20 degrees north and south of the equator. In the case of cacao trees, which produce our beloved chocolate, it is a projected decrease in humidity in this zone that's going to have um, an adverse effect on production. Coffee beans are a little different. Um, they will be affected in a different way. They, they depend on a very specific temperature range. And when it's too hot, the fruit on the coffee tree ripens too quickly and that um, degrades the quality of the coffee bean within. So aside from those of us who rely on our coffee to get through the day, 120 million people in countries near the equator depend on the coffee trade for their very livelihood. And as for wine, well, um, the microclimates of Europe's vineyards are shifting. And if you have read anything ever about wine, you know that the way wine tastes is in response to a very, very specific climate condition. In France and in Spain, those countries are just getting too hot and dry to produce the kinds of wine that they are known for. But the English and the Swedish are betting on that and they have already planted vineyards. And in our own country, award-winning vineyards are popping up in the middle of Northern Vermont. Now, okay, you're probably all wanting to go crawl under your blankets and hide because it's gotten depressing, but Speaking of the coffee and the chocolate and the wine, we're at the dessert section now. This is the good news part. Um, and I wanna say that there is a lot of really interesting innovation that's going on in the agricultural section. Um, one of the most potent tools at our disposal to bend the climate change curve in our favor is nature itself. Uh, Paul Hawken, uh, formerly of uh, Smith and Hawken, and the wonderful Dr. Catherine Wilkinson um, worked with scientists all over the world who are researching solutions to climate change, and they pulled them together in this book, um, and they got them to detail the most effective ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Five of the top 12 most effective ways to reduce emissions are nature-based. <clears throat> And more importantly, this is not some hipster artisanal dream, but methods that are recognized by global food companies. So these four um, gigantic food companies are the founding members of the Sustainable Food Alliance. And they recently sent a jointly signed letter to Congress saying, propelled by this urgency, we are increasing the energy efficiency of our operations investing in clean energy and transportation, and partnering with farms to reduce emissions and promote regenerative soil health management. So 
I think everyone has agreed we need to restart the natural systems that we have relied on beginning with our soil. How do we do this? And what is this regenerative soil management? And importantly, will we be able to sequester our excess carbon through better soil management? So regenerative agriculture refers to a series of global changes that we need to make to our crop growing practices and our livestock rearing methods in order to build back soils and build resiliency in our farming systems. So the good news is that we know what to do. We need to eliminate or reduce tillage or plowing. About 20% of US farms are now no-till, so we have a way to go, but we can get there. This reduces not only carbon emissions, but also erosion. Yes, farmers are going to need new equipment in order to plant seeds in untilled soil. We need to support this investment in new technology and machinery. Put simply, we need to pay farmers not to till. Secondly, we need to um, keep the soil covered with a cover crop. Cover cropping helps both um, keep both CO2 and water in the soil. So a cover crop is grown in a field during the off season and it covers the soil and it's kind of like a blanket, it prevents the carbon dioxide from leaving the soil. And they can also be planted um, in a fallow year. Only about 3% of US farms are using cover crops. So there's a lot of work to be done here, but it's um, when you're asking a farmer to put a cover crop on, remember you're asking them to pay for seed that is, they're not gonna get any return on. It's just going back into the soil. They can't grow something with that seed and then sell it at the market. Um, on top of that, research has shown that seed that has got a lot of different types of plant, you know, it's not just one plant, but it's clover, it's vetch, it's, it's lots of different types of plants is the best at building soil resiliency and, and um, soil health. Of course, those seeds are the most expensive. So again, we need to pay farmers to plant cover crops. We need to apply compost to build up the soil fertility, um, returning that organic matter that has been lost to our soil. This, um, I like to think of this as a twofer. It's a great way to deal with food waste. Um, and they're doing a lot of research on this. Um, there's been a whole program for years out at Berkeley where they've got huge rangelands that they're pouring a quarter inch of compost on and then measuring the, the carbon sequestration and the carbon content of the soils. It's, 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 there's a lot of work going on there. It's very exciting. And then there are other methods. Um, this is a farm I want to go to in Wisconsin and the, the guy who owns it has a TED talk that's really interesting. Um, what you see here is called intercropping where you've got kind of trees and um, bushes planted next to the crops. The crops, it's not just one crop, you know, they're, they're, there's a variety of crops um, and they've all been planted in berms to prevent erosion. Um, this kind of, this is the, the new way. It's also kind of the old way, um, but this is what we need to do to, to bring back that fertility of our soil and the diversity of soil microbial activity when you have different types of plants next to each other. Um, and there's crop rotation, which we all know um, avoids depleting soil nutrients. And it, it also um, helps to keep those plant specific pests at bay. And then there's planting hedgerows and windbreaks that also help to prevent the erosion that has um, been so rampant. So these are methods that can save farmers money because they're reducing overall dependency on chemical inputs. They're reducing plant disease and they're reducing exposure to flooding and drought and they're increasing yields. Um, even the much maligned cow has a part to play. A growing number 
of ranchers across the country and abroad are experimenting with something called managed or rotational grazing. So this is a system that moves cows to new small pastures every day or so. And then the pasture that they have left is given from several months to a year to recover. And this, this mimics the natural grazing patterns of the country's pre-colonial bison populations. The bison moved in dense packs to protect themselves from predators and they covered hundreds of acres of prairie in a year. And they left behind them these incredibly fertile grasslands that had been fertilized with manure and their hoof action. Um, and here in this really terrible slide, sorry about that, uh, from Kansas State University, you can see the benefits to plant roots and plants themselves when you have a short grazing period and then a long recovery period. Um, I encourage you to watch this TED talk by this guy named Alan Savory, who's a very controversial character, but he suggests we need more cows because the benefits of managed grazing are so great. Now, as I said, he's controversial. There are a lot of people who take issue with him and say that his methods are not replicable, but it's a really fascinating conversation to follow. And I think just one of the many conversations we all need to be, to be having. Uh, researchers are developing genetically modified plants that have these deep roots like the ones um, on that Kansas State uh, University slide and that have other special features that enable them to store carbon deep in the soil. And other scientists are researching which plants fix nitrogen best in the soil and which would lead us, um, of course, away from using quite so much nitrogen-based fertilizer. And then there are people who are working on the beef issue from a different angle. There are some scientists and entrepreneurs who are researching the notion that if you add a bit of seaweed to the food we feed cows, that will significantly reduce the methane in their belches, which is really, really interesting. And seaweed is also in the news um, today. There's a great article in the Washington Post, if you happen to get that, on how giant kelp is um, fantastic at absorbing carbon and sequestering it. So what else do we have? Oh, the food waste sector. Well, lots is happening here from curbside and community composting programs to really interesting waste to innovation to energy innovations. So um, how many, I, well, I guess you could raise your hand, but there's this farm up um, between Canaan and Norfolk called Freund Farm. And they're taking the methane from the um, manure and they're using it to power the farm. And there are a lot of other food companies that are doing similar things. Um, there's a craft factory up in, in Northern New York that's taking the methane that is an off product of cheese making and using it to power the craft the factory. Um, so there are a lot of places that are doing interesting work there. I visited a uh, gigantic landfill in the middle of New Jersey that is taking the methane from the landfill and using it to power a huge commercial greenhouse. Um, and, uh, you know, other companies are coming up with other ingenious ways to use waste, food waste so that it's used. Um, and there's work being done legislatively on fixing the whole sell-by date thing, which um, the sell-by dates are often arbitrary and of course means that perfectly good food is thrown away. And there's one final force of nature that we can all rely on. And that's you. We need you all, you know, Climate change can feel overwhelming, it can make us depressed and helpless, but choosing one aspect of it to work on helps reduce that feeling. And I feel like, you know, we all eat, so that's one place we can start, but we can all make a difference no matter what we do. Um, and we don't really have the luxury of standing by 
anymore while someone else fixes this. So I thought I'd spend the last few minutes here just throwing out ideas for ways that individuals can support nature-based climate mitigation. So I wanna start with a new, looking at our lawns with a new lens. Turf grass, you may be interested to know, is the largest crop in the United States. There are 84 million acres of lawn, more than all the federal parks put together. 10 times more synthetic fertilizer is used on American lawns than is used on uh, food crops. So reducing the size of your lawn and resisting using fertilizers is a great way to start. Better yet, turn your lawn into a vegetable garden and for that matter, forgo the herbicides and the pesticides as well and embrace those dandelions. You can even harvest them. They are certainly more nutritious provided they haven't been sprayed than the greens in the plastic box that live at the supermarket. And I probably don't need to tell you that dandelions are early bloomers and often the only source of pollen for those uh, early pollinators, uh, which are critical to our agricultural systems. Um, if we want plants to save us, we're going to need more botanists, ecologists, and soil scientists. So maybe you want to go back to school and study botany or soil science. I just heard about a woman who's 66 years old and has decided to get her PhD in botany, so um, go her. Uh, and then there's getting involved in your local town. Does your town have a climate action plan, a renewable energy goal? an environmental commission, a planning board. Planning boards make many of the local land use decisions and you can have a huge impact on climate change by sitting on your local planning board. Or maybe you wanna get involved with your local land conservancy and help preserve and steward the undeveloped land we have left because we are gonna need all of it. Maybe you wanna unleash your inner lobbyist Call your legislator and tell them that it's important to you that the next farm bill provides significant support for farmers who are making the transition to regenerative practices. Tell them to increase funding for land preservation or call your state legislators and ask them what they're doing to promote these natural systems. And if all that seems daunting, just support a nonprofit that's um, researching the science behind effective natural solutions or preserving open space or one that is restoring wetlands. Aside from sequestration, wetlands are really important uh, ally in terms of mitigating damage from extreme weather. A recent study suggests that replanting wetlands could cut the costs of future flooding in half. <clears throat> and, you know, New York has 2.4 million acres of wetlands and there's de intense development uh, pressure on those. And um, I think Connecticut is about 5% wetlands and most of it is along that I-95 corridor. So you can imagine what the development pressure is like there. Or maybe you want to volunteer to plant trees because we need to plant trees everywhere. And it seems to me driving around, I just keep seeing trees getting cut down, but we really, we really need them. So I have this pet project that I call Plant One Ask Two. If each of us planted a tree, that would be great. But if we each planted a tree and asked two friends to plant a tree, and they each asked two friends to plant a tree, and they each asked two friends to plant a tree, soon we would have planted millions and millions of trees and they provide so many benefits, not only the carbon sequestration, but shade, which lowers temperature, and we're gonna need that. They also help prevent erosion, they reduce stormwater runoff from extreme rain events, and enhance property values. Um, and as I say to my husband every night, darling, let's talk about composting. Do you have a compost? Is composting allowed in your community? If not, maybe you'd like to work with your homeowners association to get the rules changed or work with your local department of public works to install 
a curbside composting program. I'm um, excited to say that uh, here in uh, Salisbury, we are about to start a food scrap recycling program. Um, they, 80 people have signed up for the pilot. And um, if you are interested in taking your food waste scraps to the transfer station, there, here's the, the um, email foodwastepilot at gmail.com. Um, they've got 20 more spaces for the pilot program. You'll be able to compost um, your meat products as well as vegetables. So great thing to, to jump on board. Um, whoops, come on you. Why are you, oh, there we go. Um, finally, there are those that say that public policy and regulation is the only way to address climate change. And to be sure, we're going to need some major public policy shifts, but individual action is just as important. And I, I just ask you to look at what individual action did to the organic food sector. Our individual choices in the supermarket doubled the organic food sector. There was no regulation saying that people had to buy organic. Our choices can create change where, and that's nowhere more true than in the food we buy. We can use our incredible consumer power to support those farmers who are using no-till, cover cropping, and composting, and we can buy, you know, leave other stuff on the shelf. Don't buy those blueberries in January that have been flown in from Chile. Buy local berries in the summer and freeze them. Or buy ugly food or food that has been bruised. Much food is wasted because consumers don't want to buy something that is bruised or imperfect. And we can use that individual choice to diversify the plants that are grown. We, we all know that diversity is critical to healthy systems. Plant diversity helps strengthen the soil and protects farmers by diversifying their offerings. There are about 300,000 edible plants out there and we only eat about 200 of them. So are you eating your lamb's quarters and your purslane, your millet, your buckwheat and your teff? When was the last time you ate chickweed or Japanese knotweed or garlic mustard? Ask for these at your local farmer's market. I do, and the farmer usually brings them to me the next week. So helping him get rid of invasive diversifies my diet and it supports a small independent farmer all in one, wheel, uh, one meal. Finally, the big one, meat. So I'm often asked if cutting meat and dairy intake is really going to help mitigate climate change. And the answer is a little complicated. First of all, scientists say the top three actions that individuals can take to reduce emissions are to stop flying, stop driving, and stop eating beef. Secondly, of course, this alone will not solve the climate change challenge. The fact is we are talking about dealing with adaptation and mitigation now, but eating less meat is part of that toolkit for mitigating the disasters that our children face. So if we take another look at this chart, it's obvious that if everyone changed their diet to eliminate beef and eat more plants, it would have an impact on those agricultural emissions. Even eating less beef would have an impact. Cutting American beef intake by a third would be the equivalent of taking 2.3 million cars off the road. And finally, natural systems are complex. So it's important to remember those new grazing methods I mentioned, managed and rotational grazing, that may help restore our soil ecosystems and help build plant health in our prairies. So if and when we do choose to eat beef, we need to make sure it's grown by a rancher following managed grazing practices that help restore the soil. Wendell Berry said that eating is an agricultural act. 
And um, I, I couldn't agree with him more. The bottom line is that each of us can do something to help mitigate this crisis. I look forward to your questions and to hearing which path you choose to take. Thanks. we have any questions, um, you can chat them to us. Or everyone's so depressed that they don't have any questions. We have a question here and a comment. Well done. Do you know if education is part of farmer method changes? Can you be more specific? I mean, educating the farmers or the farmers at educating consumers or? Um, uh, so educating the farmers on how to rotate crops or do some of these new methods that they might not be used to and educating them about the long-term picture of what they're doing. So I think in the next farm bill, there is gonna be significant um, a, a title for, for farm education that they're gonna be expanding the work of the um, conservation soil uh, department at the USDA, because this is becoming clearly a critical issue. Um, the next, the farm bill, just so everyone knows, is um, comes up for renewal every five years. And um, it, a lot of it is SNAP um, funding for uh, food programs. And then a very small amount is, um, then there's the farm subsidies and then their very small amount has been for conservation. Um, and I think this year uh, with this administration and also with the, the, the tremendously uh, devastating effect of all these storms, we're gonna see more work, uh, more, more money in those titles. Um, the American Farm Bureau until about two years ago did not acknowledge the existence of climate change. So they're currently have finally on their website said, okay, yeah, it might be a thing, but um, they're super conservative about it and say that any, um, any legislation that requires farms to do anything um, different than what they're doing already is not acceptable. So they're one of the biggest lobbying um, organizations out there for big, big corporate farms. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting to see the next farm bill. I think it comes up for a renewal in 2023. So it'll, people will start talking about it next year. We have a question. Um, if you know what the ideal rotation crop is for cornfields. I do not. But again, um, there's all sorts of uh, resources online. And um, if you give your name to the um, wonderful ladies at the library, I'll try to point you in the direction of that. Sure. Someone asked for the um, email to get involved with the pilot food waste composting project at the dump. And I put that in the chat box. Um, Great. For that, I think it's foodwastepilot at gmail.com. Um, and someone asked, would it be possible for us to um, acquire contact information for some of the advocacy that we can do? Um, sure. Uh, it kind of depends on what kind of advocacy you want to do, but... Um, you so, know, Katie, Katie um, if you... Uh, Holly here from the library. We always send out like a thank you note to people who sign up and attend these. And if you had, to, if you wanted to give it a little bit of thought and wanted to give us a couple of addresses that you would suggest, I'd be happy Perfect. to include that information. Great. You know, because I'm sure there's lots of, lots of opportunities. Yes, there are indeed. Yeah, so we'll be happy to, to be the share. The share Wonderful. Um, I just, uh, Somebody else had thanked, said earlier, thank you for all this. It's so nice to know all the different paths to take, which I couldn't agree with more. And I'll just add that this is the second, second time this week that I've heard somebody talk about knotweed. 
somebody, a friend of mine had a wonderful knotweed dessert. And it's like, I've been kind of turning that concept over in my mind ever since. I don't know how one really yeah. cooks Japanese knotweed, but. Yeah, well, um, also I want to mention, you know, there's a, a native plant nursery up in Stockbridge. I think that it's called Helia. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, they have been having a four week program, which I could not attend, unfortunately, on how to cook, <laughs> how to cook with weeds. Okay. Um, and so um, that might be something people want to jump in on. I, I can't remember when it was starting. I think they would have to, it probably starts soon because they need the weeds to grow in order to harvest them and cook with them, right? But um, yeah, um, there's a lot of information on, um, on the web about cooking with weeds, actually. Um, you know, you do have to be careful. There was an article today in the Lakeville Journal um, which had recommended some people go and forage in the woods. And you have to really know what you're getting before you go cook with it. So I do give that caveat, you know, go with somebody who knows what they're doing for a few times before you um, trot off into the woods looking for, for things. Um, I like cooking with garlic mustard because it's invasive and it's everywhere. Um, and it tastes pretty much like ramps. Ramps are so chic, but they are ephemeral and we are over harvesting them now. Um, so why not use garlic mustard, which is toxic um, to our soil and invasive. And in my case, right out my kitchen door. Do you make like a pesto with it or how do you how do you eat it or fresh? I just saute it like spinach and throw it in some scrambled eggs or something. Hmm, sounds yummy. And, and in fact, not to follow up on that, but but uh, somebody asked, when will you be writing your cookbook for all the plants that are edible beyond the 200 that we currently eat? <laughs> so funny. Maybe for Earth well, <laughs> there are cookbooks out there on um, many. Um, a friend of mine in New Jersey uh, wrote one. Her name is uh, Tama Matsuka Wong, and she actually has a business in New Jersey where she goes foraging and then she takes the weeds and things she's found and she is a supplier to some of the more high end, um, super fancy restaurants in New York. Um, Oh, cool. And there's another book that I will send to you um, also, uh, Holly, and you could put it, maybe, you know, you could get it on interlibrary loan and people could take it out of the library um, that I can't remember the name of right now, but it's very good. We have a comment that you can substitute knotweed for rhubarb in any recipe, but only when the plant is very immature as the oxalic acid increases as the plant matures to toxic levels. Thank you. Good to know. Thank you. Very knowledgeable audience here. Yeah. Lots of thanks here in the chat for you, um, Katie. Inspiring, so interesting, wonderful. So any, any final questions? Any more questions? Maybe we're all inspired to take at least one small step. Um, and actually, uh, you can take a small step next Tuesday when we'll be hosting a evening with the Share Land Trust because they have a, a terrific uh, a set of um, public preserves, many with hiking trails. And so their executive director, Maria Grace, is going to join us and uh, walk us through some of those, so to speak. So it, it fits right in. And Katie, thank you for kind of warming up the audience for being able to actually take that. Well, I'm thrilled to. I'm, I have already signed up to, to go to come on that uh, Zoom yeah. talk. I just yeah. wish it were in person to our uh, we'll get to that. Did, somebody did send an email to the library the other day that asked where to meet next Tuesday for the talk. <laughs> and we thought, oh, that would be terrific, but not, uh, not right now. On your own so, computer. Anyway. Well, Thank you all so much. I'm feeling terribly guilty. My dinner is downstairs waiting and it is not a good choice based on our lecture this evening. <laughs> so I don't know what I'm gonna do when I get down there. You know, think about think about the menu for next week. Uh, there you go. For, There's for always sure. tomorrow. Tomorrow That's, is I another day. I won't waste anything, but I will reconsider our choices for next week. So thank you so much, Katie. This was really wonderful.
Thank, thank you. you so much for sharing Happy your, be here. your passion and your knowledge with us. Thank you all for sharing this time with us. Um, don't forget to check out our website, um, sign up for our email list. We send out a blast every Wednesday morning that tells you all of the things we have going on at the library and um, come see us uh, soon. We're open for business. So we look forward to seeing you. Thanks everyone.